All right, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to uh, the introduction to comprehensive iridology. And I am Brenda Generali. I'm happy that you're here tonight. So thank you for taking your time out on a Friday night to come uh, to this webinar. I am a certified comprehensive iridology instructor with IPA, which is the International Iridology Practitioners Association. And they have approved uh, my company as a sanctioned school. So Joyful Living Services is sanctioned and you can get, uh, we are accredited through IPA. So you can get continuing education credits through us. I'm a certified comprehensive iridology through IPA, uh, iridologist through IPA and uh, a certified nutritional consultant through the American Association of Nutritional Consultants. And I'm also now a member of the Guild of Naturopathic Iridologists and the General Naturopathic Council. There's the website, joyfullivingservices.com. Email, if you need to reach me, is iridology at netzero.net. And I put both my telephone numbers on here. So um, the office phone number and my cell. So if you want to send me a text, there's my cell. Or if you need to call me. Okay, so first thing, I want to thank you for being here. I already said that, but I want to thank you for being here on a Friday night. Really appreciate you being here. There's so many other things to do on Friday nights. And uh, here in California, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's, uh, it's really beautiful. So um, let's see. So first of all, I need to read the disclaimer. Uh, Joyful Living Services cannot be held liable for any misuse or malpractice of any techniques taught within this webinar, nor for any injury, suffering, or distress caused by students undertaking the techniques discussed. All students must accept that they are wholly responsible for their actions relating to the practice of iridology and must adhere to the relevant laws in their country and state of residence. Students are responsible for ensuring that they have appropriate insurance for practicing in their country and state of residence. Joyful Living Services cannot be held responsible for any advice given by students to members of the public. Students must adhere to the local laws regarding the requirement for registration and or qualification as an iridologist before suggesting supplements or offering, offering nutritional advice. So I was gonna give you a little bit of information about myself. I started in iridology in 1983. And I had, the reason I started in iridology is because I had a lot of uh, health issues with my digestive system. And I was under a tremendous amount of stress. And um, I had a friend who had endometriosis who was seen an iridologist and was having really good results. And she suggested, hey, why don't you go see an iridologist? So I did. And uh, he looked at my eyes and told me all kinds of things and told me what herbs to take. And I took them and got better, which led me to sending friends to him and they got better. And then one day I just kind of asked him, hey, how can I learn more about this? So he suggested that I call down in Escondido, which is in Southern California. And uh, Dr. Jensen was down there and see if I could take a class. And it just so happened that he was teaching a class in August. So I signed up. I signed up for the beginning class, not knowing if I was going to like it. And I loved it. Stayed for the advanced class, got fully certified. And that was 32 years ago. I've been in iridology for 32 years. So I can't believe it's been 32 years. In 2018, I became a member of IPA. And um, I see clients all over the world because the nice thing about iridology is you can, you can work with it remotely. So if people send in their pictures, you can work with it remotely. So it's not limited to office settings. I just opened a new office here in Auburn, which is where I am right now. And uh, my future goals include uh, completing my iridology book. The title is Iridology, The Path to Joyful Living. And I'm also working on my fellow through IPA. This was me years ago when I helped at Dr. Jensen's 80th birthday party. And uh, I took pictures of hundreds and hundreds of people for him uh, for the symposium. And uh, then of course, this is me now, so. 
this is my office that I just opened. And uh, one of the things that I found out is that uh, what's great is once you take pictures of people's eyes, you can project them onto a screen. This is a 50 inch uh, television that I put up on the wall. And so I can, um, I can project those pictures throughout um, for my clients. And so that's, that's really great because I can, I can um, enlarge this all the way up to 50 inches so that people can see their eye and we can focus on different areas of the eye and the sclera. And uh, this is my daughter here. This is the SD804 that I use to take pictures. This is my daughter. She's just kind of demonstrating how you put your chin and forehead in the rest and then you can take, and this is her eye. And uh, so that is just a little sneak peek of my, of my office here in Auburn. So what is iridology? Iridology is a study of the color and the structure of the iris of the eye as it relates to the genetic predisposition and health of the body systems. And so by looking at the various colors and the structures in the iris, we can tell about somebody's genetic predispositions. We can tell maybe what might be causing various health issues. We can tell if it's coming on down from the mom's side of the family or from the dad's side of the family. And you know that that's great because it helps us to learn what could be causing various issues or what may be coming in the future so that we can change our diet, change our lifestyle, do whatever needs to be done so that by the, you know, when we're in our 60s and 70s and 80s, we actually can still feel good, still go do the things that we want to do. So with comprehensive iridology, it is a combination of Jen Jensenian iridology and iridology from um, the National Iridology Research Association, which uses the European model. So uh, North America uses three styles of iridology. It uses Jensen Jensenian, which is Dr. Jensen's iridology, which almost everybody knows who Dr. Jensen was. You know, he's basically the father of iridology here in the United States. He brought iridology here. Uh, and then there's also Rayad, and Rayad is emotional iridology, and Denny Johnson teaches Rayad iridology. And then, of course, there's Jim Burgess, and he teaches behavioral iridology. And these are really important, you know, um, in order to help somebody with their health, you really need to uh, be able to talk to them about their emotions, because under every physical ailment, there's always an, um, emotions as well. And sometimes to learn about why people do the things they do, we need to understand their behaviors. And so both of those, RAID and uh, behavioral iridology are, are both really good uh, to learn. So constitutional iridology is a combination of Dr. Jensen and European iridology. And before Dr. Jensen passed, he asked his daughter-in-law, Ellen Jensen, to continue his studies, which she has done through IPA. It used to be called the um, National Iridology Research Association, and now it is called the International Iridology Practitioners, Practitioners Association. So constitutional iridology originated with Joseph Deck and other iridologists. It is used by medical doctors in Italy, Germany, and Russia as a screening tool, though we cannot use it here uh, to diagnose in the United States or anything like that. Um, we do do correlative medical studies all the time, and that is how we learn what's going on and what's changing, because iridology has changed quite a bit, and it is still changing as we continue to learn. Um, it teaches that the eyes are a reflection of genetic or inherent structure of the body. It is not transitional. It is accumulative. And what that means is that as we age, we can get more pigments in our eyes. We can get more markings in our eyes. They usually don't leave the eye. We usually get more. Um, the iris does not give us answers. It tells us what questions to ask. So as, I, as iridologists, it's very important to learn what kinds of questions to ask. Um, other iris and sclera changes can continue to become visible with time, and that can reveal areas that may need support. 
And it's always good to have background information so that uh, when you see a client, so that you're not doing what's called a cold reading, so that you actually have a history for your client. So the way we use iridology, by looking at the iris of the eye, we can see uh, these genetic tendencies. And by learning about your genetic tendencies, like I said before, you can learn what you should eat, what you should drink, what type of exercise you should do, supplements, lifestyle, and anything else that can help you live comfortably in your body. And iridology does not name diseases, but it shows us what areas might need nurturing or might need strengthening. It can show us areas that may not be absorbing nutrients as well as they should, and it may show us areas that may not be detoxing as well as should, which is very important when people are on detoxes. So what can iridology show us? It can show us those inherent strengths and deficiencies of organs, glands, and tissues, potential abilities of an organ to react to illness, familiar patterns of various syndromes and pathologies, certain foods that a person could have difficulty digesting or utilizing, areas of the spine that may have subluxation, potential central and autonomic nervous system imbalance, potential circulatory disturbances, potential connective tissue weaknesses, potential for glandular deficiencies, potential for high uric acid levels, serum cholesterol levels, and lymphatic congestion. Now, it, there are many things that iridology cannot show us. And the main thing is that we cannot diagnose. So we can't diagnose from the eyes. Okay, we cannot diagnose. We cannot give the name of disease a person may have or, um, or have had, or we cannot uh, identify pathology. You know, that's for the doctors to do. Okay, we can go all around it and tell them everything that we see in the eye, but we cannot name a disease. Okay, that is illegal in the United States. And why would we want to do that anyway? We're not doctors. So that's, that's for doctors to do, you know. Um, and as far as pathology goes, you know, that's done in the lab. Okay, we cannot determine if a person has had surgery that doesn't show up in the eye. We can't indicate precise blood pressure levels. If you want to know that, then we need to get out of a blood pressure uh, cuff. We can't determine if a person has parasites or indicate the presence of yeast infections, although there are various markings that can show up in the iris that can tell us there may be potential for parasites. And in the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, uh, there are ways to tell if um, there may be yeast infections or infections of some sort or possible parasites. We call those fermentation signs. So if somebody has that kind of a marking in their sclera, then we can potentially see that. But there again, we cannot diagnose. So we can work with the person, but we cannot diagnose. So we do send a lot of people, uh, we send people for a lot of blood tests and other type of tests to confirm what we might see, okay? Uh, we cannot confirm the presence of viruses, germ life, or bacterial invasion. That is also for uh, blood tests. Determine if a woman is pregnant or has had an abortion. I had a lady the other day that asked me if I could tell the sex of, um, of a baby in utero. And I told her, you know, we really can't do that. So she showed me some pictures of some slides uh, showing, you know, when there's lines in the bottom of the of the sclera on the bottom below the iris, one side would be a, a male baby and the other side would be a female baby. So based on those charts, you know, the, the baby in utero should have been a female and uh, the woman then had a test and found out that she was carrying a male. So, you know, we can't rely on that. So we can't, it can't indicate whether a tumor is present or what size it may be. However, there again, the sclera may be able to tell us uh, <clears throat> the possibility of tumors or the possibility of infections. Show whether or not a person has kidney stones and gallstones, we can't see that. We could see the possibility, but uh, normally people have to have ultrasounds and to, to really know what's going on with that. Or there are other tests. Sometimes muscle testing can tell us those things, kinesiology 
and uh, there are other tests. <clears throat> okay, it can't give exact cholesterol or uric acid levels in the body. That needs to be done through blood tests or live blood cell. There are many other uh, ways to tell about those kinds of things. Determine whether or not a hemorrhage exists or where it is located, unless it's located in the visible layers of the eye. So in the sclera, if we see hemorrhage in the sclera, uh, then you know that's one thing, but otherwise we can't tell. Show if arteries are blocked or hardened, though a potential for this can be seen, once again, <coughs> excuse me, in the sclera. Uh, distinguish the gender or age of a person predict a person's lifespan or impending time of death. We, we can't see any of that. Also, it can't show us if a person needs surgery. You know, if we see something in the iris then, and we're suspecting it may be an issue, then we can refer the person to, you know, a functional doctor or a naturopath, or maybe a, you know, maybe a surgeon that may be able to tell them, yes, there's a problem and take care of that. So, you know, that is something that we do. Uh, it cannot locate a specific tooth that may be problematic. However, there are scans that can be used uh, that can tell us if there could be problems with teeth. And there's a scan now that I'm using that's called the Zytobalance that actually does scan all the teeth and all the vertebra and um, shows you know, which teeth may be having issues and which vertebra may be out of place. So we can use that along with iridology. So there are many tools that we can use with iridology, but iridology cannot locate a specific tooth that could be problematic. Uh, show if a person has ingested poison or been bitten by a poisonous spider or snake. Iridology can't tell us that. Okay, so what I wanna do here is talk about how iridology has changed. We used to believe that iridology, there were only two colors of eyes, blue and brown, that was it. And, you know, with everybody, you know, intermingling, you know, we now have mixed eyes. And so here you can see very easily that this is a blue eye. And here you can see pretty easily that this is a brown eye. Well, in between there, we have what's called a mixed eye. Okay, so there are, there are many, many, many people with mixed eyes. And usually this color eye will look hazel from far away. So when you're standing in front of somebody and you look at their eye, you'll think, say, oh, they have a hazel eye. A lot of times that'll be a, a mixed eye. And each color iris has its own genetic tendencies. So for instance, if someone um, has a blue eye and they get sick, then they're usually going to have issues with their respiratory and lymphatic areas. Okay, so for instance, the genetic tendencies for a blue-eyed person would be respiratory. Okay, so that would include the sinuses and the bronchioles and the lungs, um, sometimes the kidneys, the, ur you know, the, the uh, bladder and so on. Okay, and then people with a mixed eye it's usually digestive. So stomach, liver, colon, pancreas, small intestines, okay, uh, liver, gallbladder, all of those have to do with the mixed biliary eye. And then we have the brown eye. And those genetic tendencies for a brown eye tend to be blood and bone. A lot of brown eyed people tend to have problems with anemia. And so uh, when we look at the eyes, we're looking at many things. So we're looking at all of these lines, anything that looks like a hole here. We're looking at the various rings, like this eye here has a lot of rings. We're looking at this kind of opaque ring on the outside. We're looking at these rings that look like the eye has been cut and then this dark here in the center. You know, we're looking at all of the rings. We're looking at all of the lines. We're looking at anything that looks white, anything that looks dark, anything that looks like a hole. Depending on where it lands on the charts, this is what tells us where there could be genetic tendencies or maybe areas that aren't absorbing nutrients or releasing toxins as well as it should. Maybe it's something that doesn't heal as quickly as it could because it may not be releasing toxins or absorbing nutrients as quickly as it should or as well as it should. And so iridology really shines with that. That, that is where it shines. You know, it really tells us 
And this is what I do a lot is I work with a lot of people who are already on programs. They're already, they already know that, you know, they need to improve their health. They kind of already know what might be going on. And maybe they've already been to the health food store and they're taking vitamins or herbs, but they just kind of want to make sure that they're on the right path. And so iridology is really great for that because we can look at the eyes and we can say, oh, so you have some genetic tendencies here, maybe some issues here. And so it looks like the program that you're on is taking care of these issues, but maybe not these issues. And, uh, you know, and I've worked with so many clients over the years with so many issues and iridology is just, it's great. It's wonderful. And you have the tools right in front of you. Every time you look in the mirror, you can look at your eye. And, uh, and then the sclera also, we look at the sclera to see also what's going on. So this is my son's eye. And I always show his eye um, and you can see the fibers here. And what's really amazing about this is these aren't actual fibers. These are actually blood vessels, millions and millions and millions of blood vessels is what you're looking at. It's, it's incredible. And so think about people that get carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, carpal tunnel, you know, you have nerves that go through your wrist and you have uh, a sheath that goes around those nerves that protects those nerves. When somebody has carpal tunnel syndrome, what happens is that sheath gets irritated. Okay, it gets irritated and it hurts. Well, each one of these blood vessels in the iris has the same sheath. It has a sheath that's wrapped around each one of these blood vessels. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing to think about that. So when you look at the iris, so you're looking at blood vessels and you're looking at, you know, what could be going on in this person's body. So when we look at the iris, we're, we're looking at the pupil, we're looking at the shape of the pupil, the size of the pupil, the color of the pupil. We're looking for any rings. Okay, so here, this is called the collarette. This is the nervous system here. And inside here is both the stomach and the colon. So think about your body. It works just like your body, okay? On the center of your body is your digestive system. And this is the center here. This is the stomach and the colon. Right next to the pupil is how we see the spine, okay? Outside this ring, the collarette, these are all the organs. And we're not actually looking at the organs because we can't see the organs unless we cut you open like a surgeon and look at your organs. We're seeing the reflex from those organs, okay? That's what we're looking at. The outside of your body is your skin, right? Okay, so here on the outside, this is the skin zone, this is zone seven. And inside that is the lymph, lymph and circulation. Top of the body is your head, right? Top of your body is your head. So from right here, 11 to one, this is the brain area, this is the sinus area, this is the head, okay? Bottom part of the body down here, the bottom part of your body, you have your hips, your groin, your legs, your knees, your thighs, your ankles, your feet, same thing here, okay? Same thing here, okay? And so everything, any place there's a spot or a line in these irises, we look at the chart and we can see what could be causing various issues. This is my eye, and this, anybody that knows iridology, all they have to do is take one look at it, and they can know instantly I was mega stressed when I got into iridology, okay? I had so much stress. I couldn't lay flat on my bed. I was in so much pain. I was breaking out in hives. I had chronic heartburn. I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. almost had an ulcer, uh, and I mean, it just continues and continues. I couldn't eat out anymore. Um, I mean, I was having constant chronic bowel issues with irritable bowel, and I was miserable. So if you look at my eye and you look at these lovely rings here, these are called contraction furrows, and they show stress, sensitivity, okay, stress and sensitivity. And what we do is we count these rings. We count to see how many rings there are, and then we also look to see how bright they are or how dark they are. So depending on how bright they are, how dark they are, where they are, how many there are, this all, this all means something to the iridologist, okay? And we can tell a lot based on where they start, like this one here, it starts and it goes here and it stops. This one starts and stops. And then we can count them one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, 
one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I had lots, lots and lots of stress. So when I get stressed, what happens to me is I hurt. Um, I hurt, my, my muscles get really tense, and then I start hurting. And that's where I hold my stress. I just kind of hold it in all of my muscles. And uh, so I've had to learn, iridology has helped me learn what to do for my body so that I don't hurt, so that I don't have problems. And then also I had a lot of problems in my digestive system. And you can see how that's dark. Now, one of the ways that iridology has changed, we used to think that the eye changed. We used to think that the color of the eye changes as you detox then all of this color will go away and you're going to have beautiful bright eyes. And that's not true. So what we have learned is that the iris is genetic. It really doesn't change. It may change just minutely, just minutely. But we don't have the equipment to be able to really see that, those minute changes. Uh, it takes a long time. We can see the sclera, the sclera changes. The white part of your eye, it changes. So that we can see when somebody is on a, a healthy program, maybe they change their diet or they're detoxing or they're drinking more water or whatever they're doing, we can see that in the sclera lines, okay? So we can see that something, their program is working. But in the iris, the iris is genetic. This shows us our tendencies. My tendency will always, always be to hold stress in my muscles. It's not gonna change. That's who I am. Okay, and so I have to make sure that I do what I need to do so that I don't do that. Or if I do do that, I know what to do. You know, I get massages, basically what I do. I'm, I do the best if I have a massage once a week. And as far as my digestive system, I have to make sure that I eat the foods that are right for me. And if I veer from that and I don't eat the foods that are right for me, I pay for it. I get bloated and I feel terrible. So that is where iridology shines. Is it, it tells you, it teaches you your genetic tendencies so that you can do the things that are right for your body. A brown eye, a brown eye has a lot of pigment. It's got brown pigment all over. So you really can't see the fibers. And the pigment is the same pigment, it's melanin. It's the same pigment that tans your skin, okay? So with a blue eye, they don't have the pigment. With a mixed eye, they have some pigment. And with a brown eye, as you can see, it just kind of looks velvety. They have a lot of pigment. Okay, And so that's the way we tell the difference between the blue eye, the mixed eye, and the true brown eye. Also, a true brown eye will usually have this uh, brown outside on the sclera. And so uh, we can see that. OK. So something really important, iridology does not diagnose, but instead it analyzes or assesses predispositions and genetic inheritance. And I do teach iridology, so all of my students learn right on and right away how important it is not to diagnose, and they learn all the correct terminology to use uh, so that they understand that we are not diagnosing, we're not doctors, we are analyzing and assessing predispositions and genetic inheritances. And what's really important is when you look at somebody's eye, you look at it with reverence, honor, and respect. Because what's happening is when you look in somebody's eye, you're not just looking at their eye, you're looking inside them. And, and once you learn iridology, you can tell not only about a person's physical health, but you can tell about their emotions. You can tell about their personality. There is so much you can tell from the eyes. So you are looking beyond their eye. You're learning who they are. All you have to do is get a, is look at somebody's eye and you can tell so much about them. And so you're, you're in their private space. So it's really important to be reverent, to honor them and to be very respectful. So as an IPA member and um, an instructor for IPA, you know, we're very dedicated and sincerely concerned with the interests of all who come in contact with iridology. And we want everybody to be on the same page and use the same principles and be reverent and have honor and be respectful. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of iridology. If you're interested in history, you can go online and you can learn 
a lot about the history of iridology. You know, I did a whole talk on the history of iridology, which you can find for free on my website. And I did research and I was surprised. So iridology has been in Australia, China, Egypt, Greece, India, Italy, and Europe, and of course, America. And I found out that it actually started all the way back to King Tut. So in 1922, an archeologist discovered silver plates while exploring King Tut's tomb. And it's thought that the silver plates are some of the first lessons of iridology. So imagine that, you know, so many people, when they think about iridology, think, they think about Dr. Jensen. That's what they think, Dr. Jensen. Yeah, well, he was the father of iridology here in the United States, but he's not the one that created iridology. It went all the way back. And if you do research, you'll see how the charts have changed a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. As people have continued researching iridology through the years, those charts continue to change. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there now that have this thing about, you know, what Dr. Jensen taught, that's it, that's, that's the end. And, you know, we all love Dr. Jensen. I mean, he was my mentor, he was my instructor. We all love him, he was a wonderful man, but he's not the end all, right? We continue research, iridology is a science. And so we continue researching and we learn new things just like any other science. And maybe some of the things that we thought were true, we find are not true and we move forwards. And so, you know, if it started all the way back in time of King Tut's tomb, just think of how much iridology has changed since that time. So Ignaz von, Ignaz von Pesli, he was a Hungarian physician and he was known as the father of Western iridology. So there's this whole story about how an owl got trapped in his tree. And when he tried to free the owl, the owl's leg broke and a line formed in the bottom part of the owl's eye. Well, you know, when I learned this, I learned it that that line formed in the iris. But if you look at this picture, you know, I guess this could be the iris and that's the pupil, but really where it would form, it would form in the sclera. It would be called a trauma fork. And if you get hurt, if you get hurt now, you should get a trauma fork in your sclera in the white part of your eye. Okay, it's not gonna show up in your iris because your iris, remember, is genetic, but it will show up in your sclera. So that would have been interested, interesting to see if it actually had a trauma fork in its sclera. If they have a sclera, I don't even know if, I, if owls have them. But anyway, we are, we're questioning that whole story because nobody has been able to duplicate that. Uh, you know, a wild owl isn't going to want to stick around while its leg is mended. So um, in 1881, Von Pesley published a book, Discoveries in the Field of Natural Science and Medicine, a guide to the study and diagnosis from the eye. And there's that word diagnosis that we can't use in the United States. We don't diagnose, we analyze. So here's Dr. Jensen. And uh, I, this could be down in Escondido at his, he had the Hidden Valley Ranch, which is where I went and took his class. It was, it was great, it's beautiful there. And uh, he, of course, wrote the book, The Science and Practice of Iridology. And if you don't have it, it's really an amazing book. And even though some of the ideas have changed, you know, it's, it's a great book to have because of the pictures that he's got in there. And a lot of the original ideas that he had are still true, uh, even though some of the things have changed. And so, um, you know, uh, he, he saw many, 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 many clients that helped many people, many people. So IPA um, is the International Iridology Practitioners Association. This was a conference that they had, and there I am right there. <clears throat> and uh, the mission, it, it was founded for the purpose of increasing and communicating knowledge concerning the art and science of iridology, and to provide a forum for the exchange of information and research with the goal of promoting excellent international iridology standards. And IPA wants to see iridology utilized as an assessment tool in all branches of medicine, 
both alternative and allopathic, in all countries and made readily available to every man, woman, and child. Isn't that a great mission? That's a great mission and a great vision. And uh, so you can go online. This is their website, iridologyassociation.org. And you can learn all about IPA and you can become a member if you want. Um, at $65 to become a member and a student. So um, it's a great organization. Everybody is very supportive and uh, it's, it's great. Um, and uh, they send out monthly newsletters. They hold monthly webinars that people can attend to learn more about iridology and uh, about new research. They hold the annual symposium. They hold a health summit. There, you know, there's all kinds of things that go on in IPA that are available to members. So this is just kind of a page that I made here to give you more information. Um, so, you know, Harry Wolf and Bill Caradona, they bridged European and, and American iridology, and they formed the National Iridology Research Association, which is, has become IPA, the International Iridology Research Association. Um, and then these are some websites, uh, Ellen Tart uh, with uh, Bernard Jensen International, and then of course, Denny Johnson teaches RAID, there's David Pesek, and he, in October, he holds the International College of Iridology. Tony Miller's in Australia, and she teaches integrated iridology. Uh, this is uh, IPA here. Jim Vergas teaches behavioral iridology. There's emotional iridology courses. And then Mercedes Colburn here in California, she teaches animal iridology. So she teaches canine, feline, and equine iridology. So if you're interested in iridology, there are so many things to learn. There are so many ways to learn it. And, uh, you know, it opens up a huge world uh, for you when, you when you learn iridology. So here's the chart that we use. This is, this is Dr. Jensen's chart, and it has revisions from Ellen Jensen, who's his daughter-in-law. Uh, one of the main things that she did, which I really love, is she color-coded it. So she added all these colors based on the, on the sy system of the body and the zones. So uh, there are many zones. And so you can see here in the center, the stomach is green. And around that, we have the intestines and the colon. And that's, you know, that's yellow. And then all the glands are purple. And the skin is this dark blue. And the lymph is light blue and circulation and so on. And it makes it a much easier. The bones... The bones are kind of this brown color, this grayish brown color. And, uh, and then there are various zones. So when you look at the eyes and you see markings, you're, you're looking into all the zones and the areas as well. And we can also use the chart like a clock. Uh, I'm sorry this got cut off, but we have like one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 and so on. And so when we, we see markings, we can see the various areas. They're called um, the zones, either the zones that go around or um, the, the various areas that they're in or the times and so on. And so we can see, you know, basically what could be causing various issues. So now I'm gonna show you uh, some of the most common markings that I see over and over and over and over in, in my client's eyes. And, you know, uh, they're very, very common. So the first one that I've got in here is called a circulatory ring. We used to call it venous congestion. And it is this kind of bluish ring that's actually on the sclera. So this is, this, this is your sclera here, the white part of the eye. Uh, this is your iris, right? And so this ring is actually on the sclera. It's not on the iris. It's out here. It's usually kind of a bluish purplish. Sometimes it's brighter color than this one here. <clears throat> and this shows us normally uh, if somebody has cold hands and cold feet, they could have one of those rings. Uh, if somebody is not getting enough iron or enough oxygen, maybe somebody's not getting enough movement, they're not exercising enough, they don't, their circulation's not great. Uh, you know, I see it a lot. I see it a lot. I see it almost everybody. And I don't know if it has to do with the air that we're breathing. Uh, I don't know if it has to do with um, just, you know, our exercise levels, but I see it a lot. I see this uh, circulatory ring a lot 
with people. And cold hands and cold feet, it, you know, I know so many people that have cold hands and cold feet. It's, that's a number one complaint is uh, cold hands, cold feet. Also, if somebody has numbing, uh, you know, if they have neuropathy or if they're having problems with uh, circulation to their feet, uh, swelling in their feet and so on, then a lot of times we can see the circulatory ring. And now here is my eye again, just because it's a great example of so many contraction furrows. Uh, and, you know, and these are caused by years and years and years of stress. And what happens is when you have stress, your pupil will contract and then it'll expand. It'll contract and expand. And that contracting and expanding creates those cuts. It, think about uh, going on a hike in the forest and the, you know, you come across a tree that's been cut down and you count the rings on the tree to figure out how old that tree is, right? We all have done that when we go in the forest, right? We go on a hike and we see a tree that's been cut down and we want to know how old that tree is and we count the rings, right? Well, for here, it looks like that, but for the iris, it has nothing to do with how old I was. It has to do with how I how stress and anxiety and sensitivity um, is held in my body and how it affects my body. And so I already told you what, you know, how I got into iridology and what I was experiencing. So um, that is, and you know, Dr. Jensen had two of these rings and he, he made a joke. I remember, I've never forgotten because he made a joke in the class about how, you know, well, everybody has to have at least a couple of these rings in order to get anything done. So, you know, I guess that was his way of just saying, hey, you know, uh, I've got to have, I have a couple rings and that's, that was his way of making a joke about it. Not everybody has contraction furrows. Uh, everybody is different. Everybody has their own markings in their iris. The slide, everybody has their own issues. And so for me, this is how stress and anxiety and sensitivity show up for me and how it affects my body. Okay, lacuna. This is what's called a lacuna. And this is an area that may not be absorbing nutrients or releasing toxins as well. Okay, so we look at that area, we look to see where it is on the chart, and that could tell us maybe possibly what might be causing some issues. It is genetic. Okay, so if you have lacuna, you're born with them. They don't go away. They don't change. They don't, you know, there used to be a belief that they filled with healing lines. They don't fill in with healing lines. Uh, what makes them look different is the pupil. So if you think about, you can see this pupil here is pretty, this is very tiny. It's a very small pupil. Okay, so if his pupil, if he's tired, his pupil is going to be larger. Okay, when he's tired, his pupil is going to be larger. Or if, he, if he's in a room that doesn't have a lot of light, his pupil is going to be larger. You know, the, the, the purpose of the pupil is to monitor the amount of light that goes in and out of the eye. So if you're in a bright room and a bright light, like I'm in my office here and it's a pretty good amount of light, my pupil is going to contract, right, uh, to keep too much light out. If I'm in a dark room, then my pupil is going to expand. It's going to get big. So when your pupil gets small, all of these markings are pulled in towards the pupil and they get longer. They get longer. They look longer, longer and thinner. Okay. If his pupil gets large, it comes out here and it gets really large. Guess what's going to happen? That's going to push all of the markings out to the perimeter of the eye. And this lacuna is going to look wider. It's going to look wider. It's going to change. But that doesn't mean the iris has changed because if we shine light in his eye again, then it, the pupil is going to contract again. It's going to get small. And guess what? That lacuna is going to be long again. So the eye, the iris hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is the pupil. What we're finding is when uh, most of the time when people are saying that their eye has changed, it's because different lighting has been used in pictures. Things that make your eyes look different is your mood. Your moods make your eyes look different, especially blue eye or uh, green eyed people. And by the way, a green eyed person really is a blue eyed person, uh, person with a lot of yellow, okay, in their iris. But if you change the color of your shirt, 
your eyes can look different in pictures. If a woman is wearing, if somebody's wearing makeup one day in a picture and the next day they're not wearing makeup, that can change the way an eye looks, the iris looks. If um, you're taking pictures in the springtime versus taking pictures in the wintertime, the light outside is different and it can change the way your eyes look. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're cleansing. Okay, it has to do a lot with the light. And so what we'll do when somebody sends pictures in to have them compared, we'll look at the amount of light that's been shined in the eye. And that also, you know, depending on how much light is shined, we can tell really what's going on. So all of this orange and all of this brown and all this yellow, in the old days, we used to think that it meant there's toxins in the body. And yeah, chances are there's toxins in the body, okay, because because we live in a toxic world, right? We're breathing the air, the same air that that's, uh, it contains exhaust from vehicles. And who knows about the water we're drinking and the food we're eating and so on, okay? And the EMFs and everything else. But the iris, this is genetic. And so we can tell from the iris genetically. Now the sclera out here, this is what's going on now. Okay, this is what's going on now. And so we can see all kinds of things with the sclera, allergies and sensitivities and all, all kinds of things, circulatory stuff going on and so on. Lipemic diathesis, this has to do with circulatory issues. So usually when we see a ring like this, it has to do with um, high blood pressure, low blood pressure. It has to do with cholesterol, triglycerides, Okay, it has to do with all of those uh, cardiovascular risks. Now, just because somebody has that ring in their eye does not mean that they have a problem. I have seen people with these rings thinking, oh, maybe they have cholesterol issues. I send them for a cholesterol test and it comes back fine. So it doesn't mean that they have the problem, but the fact that it's showing up in the iris does tell us that they do have a genetic predisposition. And that means that somebody in their family has problems, circulatory problems. Okay, maybe they don't because of the way they eat and the way they drink and what they think and what they're doing, their exercise and so on. Okay, so they don't have the problem. But if they start eating a bunch of junk food and they eat a lot of fast foods and fried foods and they stop exercising and they do all the things that aren't good for them, then maybe they will have problems, okay, because they have that genetic predisposition. So there again, iridology shows us those predispositions, but just because the marking is there doesn't mean they have a problem. I will have to say that I would say that 80% or more of people that I see when they have a marking in their eye and I ask them about it, I get a positive answer. Yes, I have a problem with that. Or yes, I'm having that symptom. Or yes, 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 yes. Okay. Very seldom do I get all no's. And if I get all no's, you know, when I'm asking questions, then I usually kind of wonder if that person is really in touch with their body and, or if they're not in touch with their body. So, you know, you really have to listen to your body to be able to understand what's going on. Okay, pigments. We used to call these soras or soric itch spots, hot spots, and now we know that they have to do with the various organs. So orange in the eye usually has to do with blood sugar, uh, so possible problems with blood sugar balance. And uh, brown usually has to do with liver. So I'm doing studies on methylation and uh, we're finding that there's a lot of people that uh, aren't methylating properly. Methylation has to do with your liver's ability to detox. And then uh, yellow has to do with kidneys. So then there's also a bright orange has to do with gallbladder. So when we see some of these colors in the eye, then we kind of start wondering, hmm, maybe this person needs to pay more attention to their, their diet, right? Mm -hmm. They need to pay more attention, make sure that they're eating uh, regularly, or maybe they're not drinking enough water, or maybe their liver's not methylating, you know? And so then, you know, we have discussions about that. So that's what pigments are all about. And a scurf rim, that has to do with the skin. So remember what I said in the beginning is that on the outside of your body is your skin. 
and uh, the outside of the perimeter of the iris, this is zone seven, and this has to do with the skin. This is a skin zone. So this shows us when it's dark like this, this shows us that this person may be having problems with skin elimination. Okay, their skin may not be breathing properly. So, you know, you eliminate as much through your skin every day as you do through your bladder and your bowels. You just don't see it. So, you know, people that put creams on their skin every day, they block up those pores. Uh, you know, people that have a lot of dry skin, um, you know, people that have problems like eczema and psoriasis, um, skin allergies, hives. You know, a, a lot of things like that uh, can be occurring when somebody has a scurf rim. If you watch television and you watch, especially when some of these models come on and they're, you know, they are um, putting on mascara or they're putting on eyeliner or they're putting on eyeshadow, they're demonstrating these things. Look at their iris and most of the time you'll see that they have a ring. It's really pretty. It looks like somebody just took a took an eyeliner and outlined their eye. <clears throat> it's really pretty, but it's showing us that uh, there there could be issues. And we used to think that that would go away with skin brushing after about a year, and we've learned that it doesn't. It's actually part of the iris where the fibers uh, get thinner, and so we're seeing the underlying layer of the iris. There are four layers in the iris. And the bottom layer is black. And so we're seeing, we're, we're looking through the layers here and seeing the back layer of the iris. Very interesting stuff. Okay, TOFI, these little, that's what these little dots are here. This is lymph. Okay, this is the immune system here. And sometimes it can be white. It's, a lot of times it's white in a blue eye. Sometimes it can be yellow. Sometimes it can be orange. Uh, just because it's orange doesn't mean it's toxic. Uh, just because it's yellow doesn't mean it's toxic. And uh, remember what I said, yellow has to do with kidneys, orange has to do with pancreas, and uh, brown has to do with liver. And so we work with uh, all those, you know, lymphatic massage and detoxing, and we work with the various organs with diet and herbs and all kinds of lifestyle and all kinds of things. Um, and uh, to work with the lymph. But uh, this is very common to have TOFI. Okay, we also look at the pupils. So here uh, is somebody that has pretty large pupils. These pupils should be right about this size. And when the pupils are large, this usually has to do with adrenal fatigue. Usually somebody's tired all the time. Uh, maybe they stay in a dark room a lot. Um, it, 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 what happens is that uh, when the pupils stay large like that, it can let in too much light. And, you know, that's not good for the nervous system. So we don't want the pupils to be always large. And then we can have the opposite. This is the same eye I showed you before, uh, where the pupils can be very tiny. And uh, this isn't good either because it shows us the person can be very uptight. Maybe sometimes medicine, you know, uh, people are on different medications and sometimes medications can make the pupils larger or make them smaller like this. And uh, if somebody's had a car accident, it can affect the pupils as well. So there are many things that can affect the pupils, but we look at that as well. And then of course there is sclerology and sclerology is a study of the sclera or the white part of the eye. And we look at all the different colors. So we can see yellows and oranges and pinks and browns and blues. And we look at all these blood vessels to see what kind they are, where they're going, you know, what shape they are, uh, you know, like this one here. So we look at all of these different markings. And, you know, here we can see what's called fermentation signs. So we can see, you know, if somebody has a lot of sugar in their diet or maybe possibly parasites, possibly candida, um, <clears throat> circulatory issues, and so on. So we use sclerology to, um, to confirm iridology. It works together. And so where the iris shows us the genetic tendencies, the sclera shows us what's going on now. So as somebody 
changes their diet or maybe they're on a detox or maybe they're on some kind of a program where they're feeding, you know, their body in a different way. They've gone vegan or vegetarian or, you know, whatever they're doing, uh, you know, we'll see the changes in, in, the, in the sclera. So if this person was very healthy, their sclera would be white. You know, all this yellow, this has to do with liver. The pink usually has to do with environment, allergies, okay? And uh, so, you know, as a person improves their health, all these colors will go away. This will all clear up. And these veins, you know, some of the veins will get lighter. They won't go away, but they do get lighter as the health issues improve. And so, you know, we can see a lot from, uh, from the sclera. So uh, for those people that are in this area, I uh, am going to be at Sunrise Natural Foods in Auburn, California on July 17th. And I am doing iridology assessments, half hour assessments. So for anybody that's interested, you can call Sunrise Natural Foods and there's the phone number there, 530-888-8973 to set up an appointment. And then I am doing Zyto scans, which is, you know, uh, full body scans. And so, you know, I, I can do that in the office. So that is available to anybody that's here in this area. I do do remote readings. So if you want a remote iridology reading, you can let me know. And uh, that's on the website. You can sign up on the website. I do teach. So my next class coming up is August 17th through December 16th. If you're the type of person that works better by yourself. Everything's recorded. You can take a class on your own time. You can start today if you want. Registration's open. If you're somebody that works better with others and you want to be in a Zoom class, uh, the next Zoom class starts August 17th. I teach Tuesdays and Thursdays, both uh, from 8 to 10 and from 5 to 7. Um, and uh, you just need to be in one of those. If you miss them, it doesn't matter because it's all recorded. And, you know, I mean, people have lives. So, you know, sometimes you're going to miss a class. And I do have payment plans. So a lot of people take advantage of payment plans. It makes it easier. You know, I would rather have uh, you be able to take class if you want to learn than not be able to afford it and not take it because you don't have $1,300 up front, especially after COVID. There's a lot of people out there that um, don't have $1,300 up front. And so I have, I have students on all different kinds of payment plans, usually $100 a month. But um, I have students that pay me, you know, in two payments, four payments, $100 a month. I, we're very flexible here. So, you know, we can just, you know, if you're interested, we'll just talk and we'll work out whatever, whatever works. So there is the link if you're interested in learning more about the upcoming class. I do teach uh, private classes. I am willing to travel to teach classes if there's enough students. And I can do one-on-one -on -one tutoring. There's my phone numbers and my email. So I want to thank you for being here tonight. Once again, you know, this is a Friday night. I really appreciate that you're here. For everybody that's not here, I have a lot of people that signed up that um, want the recordings. Uh, you know, you can, I'll send the recordings out probably over the weekend and you'll have the recording. Okay, so at this point, I wanna say thank you and have a great evening and see if there's any questions. Let me see here. Okay, so anybody have any questions? You'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. I'll ask a question. Okay. Um, I was under the train of thought that the, like lacunas, for example, can change and, you know, the eye color can change and everything you were saying. Um, the only person I had learned from was Dr. Robert Morse from his videos and I was just talking to my spouse about it tonight, actually. I was looking back at, because I'm a photographer, so I take pretty clear uh, photos. I was looking back at a photo of me from six years ago. And uh, since then, I've been on drastically changed diets and herbs and things like that, a lot of fruit fasting and raw fasting. 
and I've seen like complete circles, like maybe six of them at the bottom of my eyes completely open up. Like there might be one still closed, but it didn't exactly like elongate, like you're saying, it just kind of completely opened with no top anymore. So that was, I was just wanted to learn more about that. And then also I was very interested in learning about sclerology and I'm get, seeing a lot of like yellow show up in my eyes in, mm -hmm. and a lot of rubbing and dryness that hasn't mm -hmm. been there before. Yeah. Uh, well, in order to be able to say anything about the markings, if they've changed or not, you'll have to send me the pictures. You know, I okay. can look at the pictures and then I yeah. can tell you. Uh, the key is just uh, make sure when you when you compare the pictures, look at the amount of light that was shined in the pictures because right. that really makes a difference. And then also the angle that it was shined. Uh, it's possible that it's it's an open lacuna because the lacuna I showed you was closed. It's completely encapsulated. We also have, uh, you can also have an open lacuna that's not completely encapsulated. It'll be open on one end and closed on the sides. So that's called mm -hmm. an open lacuna. And those mean different things. So I'd be real curious. You can, if you, you okay. know, if you want to share those pictures with me, I'd, I'd be real curious to see those. Yeah, I could do that. Um, sclerology is great. Uh, it's a, it's a whole nother study and it's even it's, more complicated than iridology. <laughs> it's hard to find any information on it. You can kind of find some on irid iridology, but not so much on sclerology. So go to Grand Medicine. Okay. Okay, it's Leonard Milner uh, and uh, uh, Leonard teaches sclerology. IPA is going to be teaching sclerology, but they're not ready yet. They're, they're supposed to be taking it over and certifying people. And uh, so they are not ready to do that yet. But Leonard, Leonard Milmer, I can never say his name. Sorry, Leonard. <laughs> anyway, he's with Grand Medicine. So if you go to grandmedicine.com uh, or even iology, iology.com, E-Y-E-O-L-O-G-Y, uh, iology.com. E then okay. uh, you'll his whole thing is, is sclerology thank you and he's he's come on he's been guest speaker for me for my for my classes and it's amazing and he has he has sometimes he gives free talks and if you get on his mailing list you'll get uh, I think he does it once a month. He'll send out a, you know, an email and he'll have a picture of a sclera and he'll have it all marked up and he'll explain to you what it all means and everything. It's pretty neat. It's okay. very, very complicated. So, um, but uh, it's, you know, I didn't used to use sclerology and then I started learning it. And now I'm glad because it really does confirm and it tells you a lot more. It tells you a lot, you know, like I said, the iris is genetic and, but the sclera, it changes, it changes very quickly when people are. So for you, you know, I want to see pictures of your sclera, but the, the problem is, is you probably don't have pictures from before. So that's you, correct. So you could take pictures now of your sclera. Okay. You want to get all the different pictures. So you want to look to the left. Okay. You want to look to the right. You want to look up and pull your lids down and look down and pull your lids up. Okay. okay, and then of course you're gonna have to have somebody take those pictures, and then you know as you continue doing the program you're doing, follow the follow the the vessels that show up in your in your sclera, and the yellows and the different colors, and see if it changes. Yellow in the sclera usually has to do with liver. Uh, it can have to do with gallbladder. It depends on what it is. Okay, and so it depends on where it is, what it looks like, and uh, and so on. So okay, I'd have to see. So if you want to send them to me, I'll look at them and I'll I'll tell okay. you. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I'll do two more if nobody else has any. Real quick. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I, to, um, go ahead. I wanted I wanted to ask you briefly. You don't have to get too into it, but do you uh, do you do a lot of of talking of telling your patients or your clients to uh, to raw fast and to juice fast is it is that a lot of your diet protocol or is it more just like watching the meats the fast food like is there a certain or it depends for each case I guess it depends for each person it depends for each eye color uh, it depends on what's going on yeah it really depends okay, okay. yeah um, and my second one is just a real quick one but do you believe that the pupil uh, not only gets large and small because of light, but also emotions and excitement. 
Yes. And the okay. other thing is in iridology, the pupil, uh, the pupil shows us the condition of the spine. So when you look at the pupil, it's supposed to be per perfectly round, okay? And if you take a picture of it and you look at the pupil, there can be areas on that pupil that are flat, where it's not perfectly round, it's flattened. And that is linked to the vertebra in the spine. Wow. So we, yeah, so we can tell what, where there could be subluxations, uh, what may be causing issues. And so we send the person, you know, either to the chiropractor or massage therapist or whoever uh, to work on them. And that pupil will change. We've seen it go from flattened to, to round. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Just a big thank you for having us. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. It's Friday night and most people are out doing oh, fun I, things. And <laughs> I'd much rather be learning on a Friday night now. <laughs> well, that's great. All right. Well, uh, you know, I have a lot of free webinars uh, that I've done. I think I've done 12 now. So if you go to joyfullivingservices.com and uh, go, you'll see, a, you'll see on the menu bar on home, if you go down, you'll see one that says videos. That's where all the webinars are. You can spend many, 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 many hours watching all of my webinars for free. Okay. I don't charge for them. And uh, I have the history of iridology benefits. Um, I have family. I have a family. Um, webinar that I did. We have a hormone balance. We have all kinds, all kinds of webinars. Okay. So you're all welcome to um, help yourself and watch them. Thank you. Okay. So if there's nothing else, then I will end this recording in this class.